so much has been said about Julius Irving over the years that it's almost impossible to find out what is most important about him. From his tumultuous marriage to his first wife, Turquoise, their tragic loss of their teenage son, Corey, and his complicated relationship with his illegitimate daughter, this is everything you need to know about the family of Julius Irving. Julius Irving's father wasn't exactly the greatest dad. He deserted the family when Julius was only three, and his mother was left to raise three children all on her own, working as a house cleaner. However, Irving's absent father passed away when he was just a young child. He was only seven years old at the time. His father tragically died in a car accident. Callie May, the mother of Julius Irving, is a native of Batesburg, South Carolina, and was the youngest of 14 siblings. She got her teaching degree from Bettis Academy and married a Batesburg boy, Julius Irving Sr. They then left Batesburg to move to Chicago and then Hempstead, Long Island. A few years after they moved to Hempstead, Callie May and her husband divorced. Callie didn't have a teaching credential for New York State, so she had to cook and clean for other families. From quite a young age, Irving had to take up responsibility at home. Callie would always refer to her son as the man of the house. Irving had a younger brother Marvin to look after and an elder sister, Alexis Freda. By the time he was 13, his mother remarried a sanitation worker and the new family moved to Roosevelt, also on Long Island. The move wasn't particularly easy on Irving's older sister, Freda. She had to start her senior year in a new environment. She struggled and, after a while, dropped out of school to become a mother. Irving soon became an uncle to Freda's first son, but he was sad. He always felt his sister would have achieved much more with her life if she had not gotten pregnant. Irving's younger brother, Marky, later died at 16 from a form of lupus. Prior to his death, his brother had been in and out of hospitals on several occasions. It was a hard death to take for his family. Unfortunately, that wasn't the last stream of sadness for the family, as Freda, Irving's older sister, passed away from cancer at the young age of 37. Hallie, his mother, later died in 2004. Irving is a second cousin of the late economist Walter E. Williams, although we're not really sure about how that came about. There have been several reports suggesting that the basketball legend and the great professor are indeed second cousins, though, so we have to report it. By the time Irving was reaching stardom, he met Turquoise Brown. The first time she saw him play was in Greensboro, North Carolina, where he was on the pro team that played the United States Olympic team. Irving joined the Nets in 1973 after a messy contract dispute was settled, and shortly thereafter, he married Turquoise while he was still a rising star. The boy who had been raised in the Parkside Gardens projects in Hempstead, Long Island until he was 13 years old had finally found his woman. Irving claims that although he was devoted at first, by 1978 when he met sports writer Samantha Stevenson in the Philadelphia 76ers locker room, he began an affair with her which led to the birth of his daughter Alexandra Stevenson, who would later go on to become a tennis star. In 1981, while he and Turquoise were still enjoying the arrival of their son Corey, a letter informing him that Samantha had given birth to a girl named Alexandra and that he was the father arrived. This would not go down well at all with Turquoise. They had several violent fights as a result, with Irving reportedly even hitting Turquoise sometimes. Turquoise eventually came to terms with the new development, but on the condition that Irving would support the child according to a lawyer's agreement. Alexandra was not to be informed of her father's identity, and Irving was not to contact either mother or child. Samantha was paid $4,000 per month until Alexandra reached the age of 18 with the promise of private school tuition. Alexandra would grow up to be a tennis player, as we said, but the relationship between father and daughter wasn't known until much later in her life. Julius was not a part of Alexandra's life aside from financial responsibilities. Alexandra first found out Irving was her father when she was four years old, and she started denying it when she turned five. Instead, she'd tell people her father was killed in the war or he was a sheik in Kuwait. Alexandra didn't celebrate Father's Day, rather she celebrated Grandfather's Day. She'd show up with a neighbor or an uncle at dad-daughter nights at school. She'd write N.A. or none of your business on registration forms that ask for a father's name. 
Irving had become more of a figment of her imagination over the years rather than a secret. As an infant, Alexander demonstrated athleticism by doing somersaults underwater in the swimming pool. Later on, she would of course flourish in soccer, gymnastics, tennis, and ballet. Basketball was something she could take or leave, but then at the age of eight, she came home from school with a flyer announcing a one-time only clinic at the local gym by the recently retired Julius Irving. All the boys in her class were dying to meet him, so Alexandra asked her mother if she could go too if she could finally see her father in the flesh. She arrived with one of Samantha's closest friends, Geneva Candell, who wrote Alexandra Stevenson on a name tag in large block letters. At first, Irving did not recognize his own daughter. He'd seen images of her since Samantha would send them to the 76ers headquarters once or twice a year, but he hadn't made the connection. He did see a tall, determined little girl diving all over the court, so he picked her as one of the camp's top performers. Irving gave her a personal autograph, and when he looked down and saw Alexandra Stevenson, he said, Nice to meet you, Alexandra. In the moment, Alex froze, glared at Julius, and told him she didn't want his autograph while stomping away. Candell does recall seeing tears in Irving's eyes that day, and she also recalls returning to retrieve the autographed basketball. Alexander brought the ball home that night, refusing to allow her mother to see it or touch it. Instead, she locked the bedroom door and spent hours studying her father's autograph. She then hid the ball behind her dolls on the farthest reaches of her closet shelf and firmly shut the closet door. Her plan was to never look at it again, and basketball soon became a taboo to her. She decided she already had a dad, which was her mom. Samantha was concerned about this and determined that Alexandra required as many surrogate fathers as possible, which is where tennis came in. Alexandra had mastered every shot in the book by the age of eight, wearing dresses made by her grandmother, and men's tennis coaches were swooning over her. When she was just a young child, Samantha started taking her to see Tracy Austin's coach, Robert Lansdorp, who suggested that Alexandra might turn out to be the next Margaret Court. When she was 10 years old, her mother introduced her to Pete Sampras' former coach, Pete Fisher. When Samantha, who had been interviewing Fisher for his story, asked him to assess Alexandra's performance, he said she might one day be the best player in the world if she serves at speeds close to 100 miles per hour. Fisher, a pediatrician, agreed to coach Alexandra, which would mean Samantha driving 240 miles round trip, initially once a week, and then three times a week from La Jolla to Los Angeles, California. They needed a dependable car, and guess who came through with a Volvo station wagon? Yeah, you guessed right, Julius Irving. Julius was not exactly a deadbeat dad, he always tried to help his children, but Alexandra had no knowledge he felt his hands were tied by his wife in the agreement, and she had no idea he was a father to four additional children, Julius III, Jasmine, Corey, and an adopted son, Chio. Regardless, Alexandra already had written Irving out of her life, and her viewpoint on seeing him again was better never than late. She made the decision to dedicate her entire life to her mother and only her mother after that basketball clinic. She seemed happy with her life, although someone would always ruin it by bringing up the dad question. The more Alex excelled in tennis, the more her father's identity was closer to being revealed. By the time she was 12, she was already serving 100 miles per hour and had practiced with some hot shots like Bobby Riggs, Ellsworth Vines, Don Budge, and Pete Sampras. She once delivered a serve in high school that was so powerful that her opponent had to leave the court in utter terror. She and two other young girls, a certain Venus and Serena Williams, were the talk of amateur tennis. And when Richard Williams asked Fisher if he'd coached his girls instead, Fisher responded, no, I've got the better athlete. Well, tennis fans all know how that story turned out. Samantha wanted her 14-year-old kid at the time to realize that she possessed exceptional genetics. She therefore brought her daughter to the Julius Irving statue in front of the Spectrum while a junior tennis tournament was taking place in Philadelphia. In a statement, Irving eventually came clean and acknowledged that Alexandra was, in fact, his flesh and blood. The fact that Irving was her father wasn't made widely known until Alex advanced to the Wimbledon semifinals in 1999, the first time she had earned a spot in the competition. Privately, Julius was relieved that the information was public and that another journey was about to begin. However, Alex's life would change after that announcement. On her way back from Wimbledon, she was greeted with thunderous applause in the terminal. Airport workers and baggage clerks screamed, Dr. J's daughter! In all of her 18 years, she had never heard those words spoken in public before. She had now had an answer to the question she had asked her mother. What was so special about Irving? Well, everybody loved him, which meant everybody loved her. Alex had climbed to number 18 by the end of 2002 and was a genuine rising star in tennis. 
She had dominated all the top players, including number one Jennifer Caprietti, in back-to-back -back matches, and all she needed to do was add some finesse to all that power. Life was good. She purchased the condo in Florida and gave it a pink makeover, but her mother forbade her from buying a car. Even though it had 250,000 miles on it, Samantha still regarded their dependable white Volvo station wagon, which Julius Irving had purchased for them when she was 11 as a family heirloom. Samantha felt the car was Irving's present to his daughter, which was symbolic. About twice a year, Samantha would have a recurring dream in which Julius would magically appear on a basketball court and teach Alexandra how to play the game, indicating that she was secretly hoping for some kind of father-daughter reconciliation. However, Irving was actually going through a nightmare of his own. His son Corey, who was born less than six months after Alexandra, vanished in the spring of 2000, just a few months after Wimbledon. Another cold moment for his family. The boy had always been a lost soul, suffering from ADHD and being sucked in by cocaine. He'd been to rehab and was charged with car burglary, loitering, and prowling in 1998, all of which were later dropped. But he'd also been the one son with a little bit of Dr. J in him, the one who stood six foot four and could reverse dunk. At the age of 19, Corey was finally proud of it. He got a job at a restaurant and started shooting hoops at the local blacktop. He appeared to be stable until one day when he didn't show up for a barbecue. Corey had been missing for 40 days when Irving appeared on Larry King Live to plead for help. On air, King asked if Alexandra had contacted him and he said no. Irving had two daggers in his heart. He would often think about Alexandra because part of him always missed her and not having her around, but the drama was almost too much to handle when Corey was eventually discovered dead after accidentally driving his car into a pond and drowning. Irving and Turquoise's marriage was in trouble, and to further complicate matters, he had recently given birth to his son Jules with another woman, Doris Madden. He calls that period of his life day to day, and he was unsure of how Alexandra would fit in. But after he and Turquoise got divorced, Irving felt more comfortable approaching Alexandra. He had been keeping up with her career and had even discussed her with John McEnroe. Alexandra eventually contacted Irving in 2008 after some pressure from her mother, and they began a father-daughter relationship of sorts. Irving's first marriage to Turquoise ended, as we said, due to the tragic death of their son, coupled with some other previous issues. He then began dating Doris, who had previously worked as a salesperson at a tobacco retail store while he was still married to Turquoise. After his divorce, he and Doris tied the knot. Due to their 19-year age difference, the couple's marriage attracted some attention. The two, however, enjoy their lives together and with their kids. Doris is not only a stunning, fit, and successful businesswoman, but also engages in charitable work and is a mother to three kids with Irving. Irving eventually had another son named Jules, who is following in his career footsteps. Jules Irving was born on January 1st, 1998 in Atlanta. Following in his father's footsteps, he's also a basketball player. He's been playing since he was in high school, and he played most recently for the California Golden Bears in the NCAA. When he's not playing basketball, he enjoys playing golf. Enjoyed this family video about Dr. J's family? Then check out our other videos on the family of famous basketball stars, and if you liked the video, leave a like and make sure to subscribe for more.